Hello everyone, it's good to be with you again and we're going to have some fun today because we're not going to go swinging through the trees but we're going to be looking at tree diagrams and of course tree diagrams are part of probability and so I need you to stay focused, remember all the rules that we've already established, understand the terminology and let's make sure that we can be sure that at the end of today we will get a hundred percent for the probability of all the questions that we're going to get uh, given in our tests or exams and so I want to make sure that you've got all the concepts right let's have a look at our concept map and so yes we're starting with tree diagrams but we're going to get straight into talking about independent events what are independent events? Remember, these are events that are, have an overlap. They are not mutually exclusive. And so we recognize not only do they have an intersection, but by definition, we have said that when we are to calculate the independent event, we recognize we must multiply the two probabilities together. So be very clear, it's the probability of x multiplied by the probability of y. And what's this word replacement? Well guys, replacement is a process that we do when we're having a probability trial. So for example, if we were taking socks out of a bag, then we would need to make sure that once we've removed one sock, before we do the second event, we would have to put it back. And that means that the total number in the sample remains the same. So the probability of the first event does not influence the probability of the second event. Let's be specific and let's use an example to illustrate this. So we're told that in the, this drawer we are going to select some socks and in the drawer uh, it, there are five black socks, there are three white socks and two red socks. Now you recognize that the total number of socks in the drawer is 10. And if we were to calculate the probability of putting our hand in and selecting randomly, we wanted to know what the probability of the red sock is, then, or the white sock at least, sorry, white sock, the probability of the white sock. We know that there are 10 in the total sample. The number in the sample is 10 the number of white socks is 3, so it's going to be 3 out of 10, which is a probability of 0 0.3. Now, that would be fine, and we recognize that's one event. We'd be able to calculate the probability for the other socks as well, using the same probability formula. But let's say that we have a second event. This time we're going to take that white sock and we replace it. We put it back into the drawer. Do you see that the number in the sample is now still 10? So when we do the second pulling out of the sock, we're going to be able to calculate the probability in exactly the same way. So if we do the second situation, we'd recognize that the probability of selecting a white sock is still going to be 3 out of 10. And that's because we had replacement. The probability of the first event did not influence the probability of the second event. And that's what makes these two events independent. Remember that when we're doing these sort of calculations for independent events, that when we have the two things multiplied together and we say the probability of A multiplied by B, uh, that intersection is going to be the probability of A multiplied by the probability of B. So be very clear about that rule for independent events. But what about dependent events? Um, dependent events take place when there is no replacement. So in the same scenario, for my first situation, take a look. The probability of the white sock for the first trial was, you agree, 3 out of 10. Now, if I am going to take out 
another sock. And I'm not replacing the sock that I took out. There are two possibilities. The one possibility is in the first event, I could have taken out a white sock. Let's say I took out the white sock. Then in the second event, then notice what I've got. This is the probability of the second event. There's no replacement now. In the second event, how many white socks are left? Well, if I didn't put the white sock that I took out back, then I've got one less white sock. So I've now got two white socks. What's the total sample space? Well, the total sample space is no longer 10. It's 9. So if you look here, it would be a probability of 2 out of 9. And can you see, by taking the first probability, the second probability has changed. If I didn't choose the white sock in the second time, there is an alternative. If I didn't choose a white sock, then I could still have had three white socks left in the drawer, and I've still got nine. But the probabilities are not the same as they were at the beginning. So that's the definition for a dependent event. Remember here again that we cannot find, if we've got the intersection of those two events, we cannot use the multiplication formula. In fact, if we multiply the two things together, and we find they're not equal, then they're not independent. And we've recorded that in this statement over here. Remember, for dependent events, they are not mutually exclusive. So there will be something in the, in the um, intersection. We also recognize the probability of the one influences the probability of the other. But this identity doesn't hold true. They're not equal because they are dependent events, not independent events. So let's focus now as we look at these ideas of independent and dependent events uh, together with all the other rules that we have on what a tree diagram is. A tree diagram is a graphic representation of what happens when we have a series of events that can be following on, a series of choices that can take place on a particular day. And the tree diagram is very useful for representing all the outcomes. And then by looking at that, we can also see uh, the probabilities of various things taking place, and we can do some calculations. So it illustrates all the possible outcomes of multiple events. Let's have a look at an example. So if you are given the famous choice at a restaurant of chicken or beef, and then on top of that, chips or mash, we can represent the, all the possibilities uh, in this tree diagram. We start off at a point and we draw a line. That C represents the chicken. This represents the beef. And we are recognizing that is one choice. At this point, we can then choose to either have chicken and chips or chicken and mash. And so we've got another set of choices. And we've represented that by a fork in the tree. So in this situation, this outcome is chicken and chips. This outcome is chicken and mash. This outcome would be beef and chips. And this outcome would be beef and mash. And so we can see all the possible outcomes, possible combinations of making those choices. Now what's also very interesting is that when we get problems to solve with tree diagrams, we're often given different probabilities because there's no chance really that most people will choose chicken or beef. It won't be a 50-50 chance. It will be some probability. But what's important to look at is these two choices are mutually exclusive. And so when we look at them and we put the probability over here, let's say that this is four out of five people are going to choose chicken. That means that one out of five chooses beef. Those two numbers add up to one. And the same thing happens over here where we have chips and mash. 
Let's say that there are three out of five choose chips and two out of five choose mash. Again, these numbers add up to one. So in the same way, we can get proportions over here. We could say when we're having beef, there could be three out of five as well and two out of five but those numbers will add up to one. And so there becomes the addition rule, the adding together of mutually exclusive events. Remember, you can't be chicken and, or, or sorry, or chips, and they, they don't happen at the same time. Uh, it's, it's together. It's you're wanting chicken or chips, that combination together. You can't have a choice of chicken or beef. You can't be chicken and beef on the same plate. That's not allowed. In the restaurant, you either have chicken or you have beef. So the, that's in the sample that you've got. It adds up to one. Concludes all the, the elements there. So they're mutually exclusive. You can't decide that you're going to have chips and mash. That's not allowed. But what I want you to see is along the stem, you can get combinations now that are multiplications. They're, these ones were all. That was all. That was all. But along this way, we're going to get and. Okay? And so we can determine the probabilities by multiplying these things together and getting the, the, the outcomes out of the total. I hope that gives you a grounding of what a tree diagram is. You might have encountered them sometime before. They're a lot of fun, but you have to be careful to put all the information into the tree diagram. So let's take a quick break. After the break, we'll be back to discuss some particular problems. <music> Welcome back. Remember our focus today is on tree diagrams. We're going to try and include all the rules of probability, those very cool ones that help us to determine what an outcome, what the chances of a, an expected outcome or a desirable outcome will be. Now the tree diagram helps us to plot all the possible outcomes and then helps us to do some calculations in terms of what could be the most favorable event taking place when we're looking at two or more uh, events possible uh, in a particular time. So these can be choices. They can also be activities. They can also be chances. Let's have a look at a particular problem that will outline for us how we can use a tree diagram to solve a problem. So we mustn't forget our rules and our terminology for probability, but here is the question that we're going to explore in a little bit of detail. So Josh decides that he's either going to cycle or walk to school. And when he cycles, the probability that he's on time, so he's either early or on time, is 0.9. Remember, that goes with, with when he cycles. Um, if he walks, the probability that he's on time drops to 0 0.8, or 80%. Now, he cycles to school 60% of the time. What we're required to do is to represent this information in a tree diagram. So let's go and have a look at the tree diagram. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to plot all the options Okay, so we can make sure that we've got all the options. Can you see that there are two modes of transport, either to walk or to cycle? And then there's either being on time or early, and I'm just going to call it early for E, and L for late. Okay, so let's set up our tree diagram. And in terms of this, I'm going to, to use the dot to start with and I'm going to draw one line up there, and I'm going to say, let that be the walk line. 
and then let this be the cycle life. There's a choice. He can either walk or cycle. There's no other choice. These two form the sample set of the modes of transport that he has. Then the choice over here is that he can either be early or he can be late. So we're going to say early and late. We recognize the same choice applies here. He can be early when he's cycled or he can be late. And so let's make sure that we've put down all the options, all the combinations of cycling and being early or cycling and being late and make sure that we've got it all sorted. So if you look at the end here, we'd recognize this one would be walking and being early. This one is walking and being late. This one is cycling and being early, whereas this one is cycling and being late. So that represents the basic structure of the tree diagram. Let's, we could add in those percentages. I'm going to do that as I answer the next question uh, so that we can be clear about all the data together. So this is the basic tree diagram. Of course, you can add in the percentages onto each of the stems, making sure that you follow the rules. But let's look at the next question. So what we're asked to do in this question is to determine the probability that uh, he is late for school on any day. So we are looking at all the options that are late. So if I go up to my probability tree over here, we'd recognize there he was late when he walked, there he was late when he cycled. And we have to find out what the probability of each of those is so that we can combine them. Because remember, it's either that he walked and was late or he cycled and was late. And so really what we're looking for here is the probability of walking and late or cycling and late. Please make sure that you recognize it's both of those, walking late or cycling late. And that's exactly what we're going to do. So let's go to our question and get some more working space. And we've got some detail that we can put on here. So the first thing I'm going to do when we recognize the information that's been given, we're told that 60% of the time he cycles. So I'm going to say that this is 6 out of 10. And that means that he's going to walk 4 out of 10 times. Uh, we recognize that he is uh, on time, so he's early, 90% of the time, or 0 0.9 when he cycles. So when he cycles, he's uh, early 90% of the time. So we're going to say the early choice here is 90%, and the late is going to be 0.1%. Um, we recognize that when he walks, this early drops to 0.8%, and the late then must increase to 0.2%. Uh, I could change that to 0 0.6, and this one I can change to 0 0.4 if I don't want to have the fraction. So what we need to recognize is that we have to determine when he, the probability that he is late for school on any day. So if he cycles, we recognize it's not every time that he cycles, it's 60 percent, and of the 60%, he is late 0.1%. So to get the cycling and being late, we're going to have to multiply those two probabilities together. So we're going to say it's the cycling and being late. So we're going to say 0.6 multiplied by 0.1. That is what that probability is there. And over here, we're going to say this one was 0 0.4. This was walking and being late. So it's 0 0.4 multiplied by 0 0.2. Now, 
let's use the calculator just to make sure that we've got those values correct. The first one is not too difficult. We can get that without doing the calculator, but I'll do it in any case. 0 0.6 multiplied by 0 0.1 is going to be 0 0.06. So the probability here Zero point zero six. Uh, let's do the the other one. Uh, pick up the calculator again, and clear that. We're going to say zero point four multiplied by zero point two, and we get an answer in decimal of zero point zero eight. So. 0.08. Now remember what we were saying earlier, that we want to calculate for any day. And that means it's a combination of either cycling and being late or um, walking and being late. Now, to do that, we've got to recognize that these are going to be different events. They are separate. You can't have them mixed up in between. So they are mutually exclusive events. You can't cycle half the way and walk the other, or you can't be early and late. No, that doesn't work. So we can use the OR rule, the addition rule for mutually exclusive events. And the way that we can recognize they are mutually exclusive is because we can add them here and see they're adding up to zero. There's no intersection between cycling and walking. So in this case, I'm going to do the working over here. And we're going to say the probability of being either uh, cycling and late or walking and late is going to be the probability of cycling late plus the probability of walking and being late. And so if we do that, it's a simple matter of saying 0 0.06 plus 0 0.08, and that is going to give me an answer of 0 0.14. Right, I think we've got that sorted. Very good. I hope you're following. Make sure that you see that there is lots of detail on this probability tree that we can work with. Let's go to the next question. And the question is simply this. Are walking to school and being late independent events for Joshua? So let's just go back to the, uh, the, the tree where we've got the... Um, the probabilities all sorted out. And what we're asking is, is walking and being late independent? Now, do you remember what independence means? Independence means that if we look at the two together, walking and late, then we can take the probability of those two and multiply them together. So walking and late, we recognize walking and late gave us um, 0 0.08. Um, if we take that one multiplied by that one, that's exactly what we're getting. We, we'll be able to see walking and late out of all the samples that we've got, that this one multiplied by that one, we've calculated as if it was independent. And so I would say that these are in fact independent. You might want to think about all the possibilities and then look at the intersection as well. But for the moment, I think you can see that we've calculated it by multiplying the two probabilities together. So we would have to say, yes, they are independent. Let's move on. And we've got another question. Let's have a look at this. This one is a little bit more involved. It doesn't have parts to it, but it follows exactly the same process. But it has a little twist in the tail because it deals with things that are not. When we deal with things that are not, remember we are dealing with complementary events. When we have a set of outcomes 
and a set that is not in that, we say that those are complementary. These things are mutually exclusive, and so the probability of the two of them coming together will add up to one. And that we're going to see on the tree diagram very clearly. So here I've drawn a little sketch of the tree diagram just to get us going. We can recognize that we've got sunny and not sunny. We've got that you're going to play tennis and not play tennis. You play tennis or not play tennis. And so it's a very clear sort of tree diagram that we can see that this is sunny and you're going to play tennis. This is sunny and you're not going to play tennis. This is not sunny, but you're going to play tennis. And this is not sunny and you're not going to play tennis. So of those four outcomes, you can see that two, two of them require you not to play tennis and two of them require you to play tennis, whether the weather is sunny or not. And so it's quite interesting to be able to see that. Let's add in the probability data from the question to make sure we can do the calculations. So what we're told is that tomorrow the probability that it's going to be sunny is a third, 0 0.03. And we recognize that Jen will play tennis if it is uh, sunny 80% of the time. So uh, let's put that up and make sure that we've got it. Sunny, 0 0.33. That means not sunny, 0 0.666. Uh, we recognize she's going to play tennis uh, in the probability here. We'll play tennis if it's, uh, we'll, if it's sunny 80% of the time. So let's put the 80% of the time in, and we're going to say 80%. That means she won't play even if it's sunny 20% of the time. Let's have a look uh, at the information to recognize that if it's not sunny, the probability that she will play tennis is only 0 0.4. So if we go to that, she will play tennis here, 0 0.4. Now remember these two choices, they're complementary. And so we must be able to add them to get 1. So 1 minus 0 0.4 is 0 0.6. And so if we're wanting to get the probabilities now of her being able to uh, recognize that the final result that what we're wanting is determine the probability that she will play tennis tomorrow. Now there are two strands that we're going to look at. So be very careful that you get that. The two strands we're going to look at are these ones here. The ones that are that and this one that follows that. And so to get the total of that, we are going to need to recognize that these probabilities have to be multiplied together. Uh, and we recognize that we can then say it's either sunny and tennis or not sunny but still tennis. And because they're uh, exclusive events, remember the probability here is going to be sunny and tennis or sunny and not tennis. Guys, we seem to have come to the end of this section without doing those calculations, but I'm sure you can get them. It's just a matter of plugging those values into the calculator, and I'm sure you'll get the right answer. The most important thing is not really getting the answer on the calculator, but understanding how we're going to get those answers. And so the tree diagram makes it very clear. I hope you've got that. Let's take a short break, and then we'll be back to do some more investigations of tree diagrams. Welcome back. Guys, we've been looking at tree diagrams, investigating these different types of events. And in particular, we've been focusing on independent events represented in a tree diagram. In this example we're going on to, we're going to look at dependent events. So on our concept map, remember that dependent events 
are those that are not influenced. So the probability of A is not going to, is in fact going to influence the probability of B. They are related. There's going to be a change. Because of this one, this one is going to change. Whereas independent, there is no relationship between the probability of B and the probability of A. They are not related. If B happens to be a certain number, A can still happen to be whatever it likes. There's no uh, requirement that the one comes first or the other one comes first. They're going to be as if the other one doesn't exist. That's why we say they're independent. And remember, for independent events, we can recognize that we multiply those two things together, and that will give us the intersection of those events. Right, let's make sure we can apply this now to a tree diagram. And the tree diagrams that we've been dealing with, we've all recognized that they had a certain amount of independence. But in this case, because there is no replacement, we recognize this is a clue for independence. But let's get into the detail. So we're told we've got three red balls and five yellow tennis balls. What we recognize is that this player picks up the balls at random. So there's no order here, there's no preference. And she then picks up, a, she, uh, picks up the, the ball, she puts it to one side, and then she does not replace it. She doesn't put it back into the back, and then she picks up a second one. Now, we're asked to draw a tree diagram to represent the above, showing all the possible outcomes. And so that's exactly what we're going to do. So let's go and do this, draw the tree diagram, and fill in as much detail on the tree diagram as possible so it will help us with any further investigations or calculations. So the first thing we need to recognize, I've already set it up. At the starting point, we recognize that we can either have a red tennis ball or a yellow tennis ball. And so I've got the red over there and the yellow over there. And that's where the branch takes place. Because it can either be red or yellow. Remember, these aren't uh, some sort of uh, in-between row that you can get half red, half yellow. These are mutually exclusive. They don't exist without them. It can, it's definitely separated between the two. They're disjoint, either the red ones or the yellow ones. Now, how many bo uh, tennis balls do we have in total? Well, the sample size, the number in the sample, is going to be 3 plus 5, which is 8. So this tells us not only are they mutually, uh, uh, they're mutually uh, exclusive, but they're also complementary. Because if we have the probability of the 3, we'll recognize the probability of the 5. Those will add up to 1. Be very clear about that. So let's put in the probability of the red ones now. So we recognize there are three red, and there were a total of eight in the sample space, and we recognize that's three out of eight, whereas in terms of the yellow ones, there were five yellow ones, and that's five out of eight. Now, if we add those together, can you see it will give us an answer of one? And that's exactly what I was going on about just now, that these are both mutually exclusive and, uh, in fact, complementary events. It's important on a T diagram to recognize at each one of the junctions, you will get those probabilities adding up to one. And that's the way you can check that you've got the answers correct. When we go along a stem to get the final probability, we are going to say it's this one, and that one, and whenever we have an and, we multiply. So let's make sure that we've got this correct now. That was our first dip into the, the bag. In our second dip, and for our second dip, I'm going to change the color, we recognize there wasn't replacement. So if I chose a red ball, the probability of choosing the red ball was three out of eight. I've chosen the red ball. What does that mean? I've no longer got three red balls. I've only got two of them because I chose a red ball. And how many do I have in total? Well, I've taken a, a ball out of the bag, so there are no longer eight. There are now seven in the sample space 
for the second sample space. So this is two out of seven. And if we go to the yellow ball, remember in the first case, I chose the, um, the red ball. Uh, in the yellow ball, there were still five yellow balls left. So that, but in total, there are seven balls in the back. So if I happen to choose red and then yellow, it would be a probability of three out of eight multiplied by five out of seven. The reason the seven has gone down is because there were fewer balls in the sample space. I hope you can see that the outcome of the first event affects the second event the probabilities are no longer exactly the same. If there were dependent events, independent events, we would see that that wouldn't be the case. Now, let's move on and recognize the following thing. What about if we chose the yellow ball to start with? So I've chosen a yellow ball uh, that's on this stem, and I now choose a red ball. Well, that means that I have seven balls in the sample space and I didn't choose a red ball to start with so if I'm going to choose a red ball in this case the outcome there's going to be a probability of three out of seven of getting that red ball but what about if I've chosen a yellow ball and I choose a yellow ball the second time as well well then there were only four yellow balls left and there were seven in total in the sample space. So guys, I want you to see now that if I'm going to calculate the overall probability or the outcomes, I can put those onto the, onto the tree diagram and then do the calculation. So that's my next step. In each case, in each time the branch split, notice vertically they added up to one. Just like I showed you over here. These ones add up to one, these ones add up to one, and so we're, we're on track. This option over here gives me the option of a red-red. This one is a red-yellow. This one is a yellow followed by a red, so it's yellow-red. And this one is a yellow-yellow. So just to help us and to make sure that we understand how are we going to find the probability of each of those events happening? Because remember, it was this one and that one. And whenever we have an and in a uh, tree, we've got to multiply. And so that's exactly what we're going to do. So the probability here is going to be 3 over 8 multiplied by 2 over 7. This one is going to be 3 over 8 multiplied by 5 out of 7. This one is going to be 5 out of 8 multiplied by 3 out of 7. And this one is going to be 5 out of 8 multiplied by 4 out of 7. Okay, let's get the calculator up and let's make sure that we can get these values. So clear it and then let's go 3 divided by 8 I'm going to do it into the fraction button. It's going to be a little bit easier, I think. 3 um, divided by 8. 3 divided by 8. Multiplied by the fraction again. We want 2 out of 7. So we're going to say that's 2. 7 goes underneath. And we're going to say... What is that probability? That gives me a probability of 3 out of 21, which is 10,71%. So I'm going to write that 10,71% or 0, uh, 0,171. I'm going to write it as the percentage. 10,71%. Now, guys, I can carry on and do all of those calculations uh, just using the calculator. I'm not going to waste time doing that. Let's have a look at what the next question is because might, we might not to do, need to do all of those calculations. Here we go. It says determine the probability that the player picks balls of different color for the two selections. 
Okay, so there are two ways to do this, and I want to show you both of them. Uh, they need to be of different color. Now, unfortunately, I've already started to calculate when they're the same color. Ah, oh, that's a pain. But you know what? There's a trick thing that we can do to make sure that we've got it sorted out. And this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to calculate when they're the same color. And then I'm going to apply the complementary rule. Because remember, these are complements of each other. And so we can use all the elements in the sample space, we know that's one, and, and subtract when they were the same color. And what we'll be left with? Those that are the different color. So remember, let's get going with that particular calculation, and then we'll be able to see it. So again, we've got the first one. Let's do the second one, which was five out of eight. Five divided by eight, and I'm going to get the decimal fraction. I'm going to multiply that by uh, four divided by seven. And we get an answer that as a decimal is 20 comma 41%. So in terms of my decimal, 20 comma 41%. So guys, here's what I'm, I'm saying to you. If I want to calculate uh, when they are different colors, I need to recognize this percentage plus that percentage subtracted from the total will give me, so when I add all of these percentages, let's do it this way, if I say this one plus this one plus this one, what do we know about those? If we added all those percentages, well, it must equal one, okay? And we want to know what the percentage of X or Y is. Remember that when we're asking for when there are different things, we're saying it's this combination, R yellow, red yellow, or yellow red, and it's an all. So we are going to recognize we're going to use the addition rule there. But in this case, we're going to use the addition rule for the ones that are the same. So let's do that first. And I'm just going to find some space. 20 comma 71 and uh, sorry 10 comma 71 and 20 comma 41 I hope I can remember those uh, as I find myself some more space uh, and what we've said is this was 10 comma 71 this was 20 comma just check on the calculator 20 comma 41 20 comma 41. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to say to myself, let's find the probability of red, red, or yellow, yellow. Have you got that? We're wanting to see how these add up together. And if we do that, we recognize they are mutually exclusive. So this is the probability of red, red, plus the probability of yellow, yellow. And so if we do that, you'll see that it's going to come to these two percentages added together. And so on the calculator, I'm going to put that in. I'm going to say it's 20 comma 41 uh, as a percentage, but I'm going to do it as a fraction now, plus 0 comma one zero seven one equals zero comma three one 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 and I round off the, f the fourth one to a two so it's thirty one comma one two percent so overall we recognize that this probability that we've got of these two added together because they were mutually exclusive is thirty comma Make absolutely sure, 31 comma 1. Let's make sure that we get that right, 31 comma 1, 2. I'll just erase the, the 30 there and put it back into the pen, 31 comma 1, 2 percent. Okay? Now, have I answered my question? Well, clearly not. 
because what I've calculated is the percentage of getting both the same. But this is the power of the complementary rule. Guys, if we use the complementary rule, we can subtract that number from one. And so that is what we're going to do. So to find the different colors, to find this probability of either yellow red or between those two, or we're going to say that probability is going to be the probability of um, red yellow or the probability of yellow red and that's going to be one minus that probability that we've just worked out which was red red or yellow yellow so we're going to subtract and we're going to see what we're going to get so here we go hope that we've got this all sorted and we're going to say we're going to take that value and here's my little trick that I'm going to do. I'm going to multiply this by uh, 1, but I'm going to make it a minus 1. Um, in fact, let's just do the minus first. I want to take the answer and I'm going to multiply it by minus 1 and see if that gives it to me right. That's correct. And then I'm going to add 1 to it. And guess what I get? I get an answer of 0, 0,6888. So that's 68,89%. 60, so my answer overall, the percentage of getting uh, two different colors, is 68,89. 68,89%. Wow. That took some time to get going and to get through it, and we've used a lot of different rules. Now, you might say, but there's a shorter way to do it. And yes, there are other ways to do it. Please remember that you can practice each of the ways, and you will confirm that the ways that you've used will get you the same answer. So don't be afraid. Get your calculators ready and check, check, check. That's why at the end of a test or an exam, if you've got some extra time, you can not do it this method, but do it the direct method. But remember, when we calculate the probabilities, we've still got to do the or sum to get them together. It doesn't matter whether it was red, yellow, or yellow, red, but we could calculate it directly. Let's just do a quick recap and make sure that we're on track. So in this lesson, we've looked at tree diagrams. And within looking at tree diagrams, we recognize that the two things in the different stems are mutually exclusive. That means that if we're going to take the probabilities across the stems, they will always add up to be one. So when we add those in the or thing, uh, the or rule, that's going to give us a total of probability of one, of a or B is going to give us uh, one. Uh, as we, we, because we recognize that is going to be the probability of A plus the probability of B, and they're going to add up to one. We recognize that for independent events, we've spent some time talking about those, the probability of the one's not going to affect the other, and the probability of A and B, if they are independent, there is simply the probability of A times the probability of B. And for dependent events, remember, that's where we get no replacement. Okay. Guys, dependent events, replacement. Okay. Please make sure you've got all of those things at your fingertips. The next time you get a tree diagram question, I bet you the probability of you getting it right it's going to be much higher than 50%, maybe even 90%. From me, thank you so much. Goodbye.